but I think it's going to work today. So, uh, these, this is a scripture one. The author of Hebrews wrote that Jesus is a priest according to the order of this person who blessed Abraham. It's a very common name. You probably always thought you'd name your first child this. John. 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 Matthew. No. Jacob. No. Yeah. I'm guessing it's really not common. Who's there? Melchizedek. <laughs> That's what I think. <laughs> you never thought about that for your first child, brother? Okay, this is her tradition question. In the early 19th century, Methodists living on the frontier often met in these gatherings to listen to traveling preachers. Tabernacles? Revival? Well, you're close. Where did the revivals meet? Tents. Tabernacles. Tents. Well, where was the tent? Under a tree. Under a tree. There's a word. You all know it. Y'all got this word. Somebody knows it. Camp meetings. Whatever. Oh, uh. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry, but you, if you don't get the right phrase, it's like Jeopardy, you can't say the wrong one. That would probably be in, under a tent. Yeah, it might be under a tent, but it might have been under a Rush Arbor, too. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> Despite suffering from tuberculosis, Melville Cox, the first American missionary sent to a foreign country, helped establish the Methodist Church in this East African country. I know my geography is a little Sudan. African, Not Sudan, I don't think. You're Gandhi. You're Gandhi. No, I don't think you're Gandhi. Let's see who it is. We're ready. We're ready. <laughs> Liberia. Liberia. Okay, well, uh, I got a few questions in there that you probably will know in a little bit. Another tradition question. In the U.S., United Methodist Annual Conferences are organized into jurisdictional conferences outside of the U.S. Annual Conferences are organized into these groups. I should have included this in my earlier little talk and then you would have known. Congregational? No, central conferences. Central conferences. In the ages past, when we were separated racially, there were central conferences that separated the African church from the white church. Now that's all, we're all together, but it happened since 1939, I think. So, okay, next question. This is a reason question. In two years, Harper will be twice as old as she was five years ago. How old is she now? <coughs> Boy, y'all are quiet. <laughs> I hear the numbers going off. <laughs> Phase one. Okay, here's the answer. Should be 12. 12 plus 2 is 14. 12 minus 5 is 7. That's how it works. Uh, Y'all had that going in your head, right? Credia, you knew that, right? Uh, yeah, okay. I'm so, we told him that. that he <laughs> Jim, you're the CPA. You're supposed to know these things. This is where I'm working on my taxes. <laughs> A tradition question is next. This rite, which usually involves young Christians, affirms the vows of baptism. Confirmation. Confirmation. Who did that? Linda. Yay! We got the right answer. Another tradition question. The Greek word for pneuma, meaning wind or breath, refers to whom? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Yeah, see, y'all are doing great. <laughs> doing great. Back to Scripture. In what two books do we find the Ten Commandments? So far I've heard Genesis, Leviticus, Exodus, Deuteronomy. The answer is Exodus and Deuteronomy. Let's see if we got another one. Another scripture question. If you were to arrange all the books in the Bible in alphabetical order, which book would come in last? It's not Amos. Zechariah. Zach, yeah. Zephaniah. Zephaniah. Yeah, that's the answer. Good job. And another scripture. All four Gospels tell us what the, that this woman visited Jesus' empty tomb on the first Easter morning. Mary. 
Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Well, you can see you're catching on. Another scripture question. How many books are in the New Testament? <laughs> Ooh, I heard that. Ooh. There's 66 altogether. Ten. It's not ten. <laughs> What'd you say, 23? 30 is not, no. 23? No. Okay, Johnny, we're It's 27. I'm as loud as I can get, Rodney. You might have to move up closer. <laughs> oh, where are our hearing aids? <laughs> He's got his hearing aids in. <laughs> uh, this is a tradition question. After North America, which continent has the most United Methodists? Johnny's saying Africa. China. What do you think? China. You said China? No. Asia. The answer is Africa. In fact, we have a, in Côte d'Ivoire, we have a United Methodist, not just Methodist, but United Methodist group there. Um, okay, next question. This is a tradition question. On the first Sunday before Lent begins, we remember this event, when Jesus' face shone like the sun and he was joined by Moses and Elijah. Simple question. They're up on the mountain. Okay, Johnny, put it up. It's the transfiguration. It's one of the times in the Bible we see the God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit all at once. Okay, back to our tradition. This is the first day of the Christian calendar when we come and should be commemorate, I think, not commiserate, the visit of the Magi. <laughs> Uh, it happens right after Christmas. It's Epiphany. What day is Epiphany? Anybody know? January the 6th. Okay, this is a recent question. While on vacation, Ellen visited her father's father-in-law's only daughter's only son. What is the relationship to Ellen? None. None is not the answer. He's Ellen's brother. Okay. <laughs> okay, that, that's our fun for today. Uh, you know, we're gonna we're not gonna do this next week because Chuck will be here and he has no trivia in his mind. But uh, but we'll we'll keep doing it for a while. I've got bunches of them left. Uh, so have, you got a few this week, right? There were some. That you, so you're not feeling totally dejected and left out. Did you learn anything? How many books are in the New Testament? <laughs> What's the day that we're talking about celebrating the gift of the Magi? <laughs> See, we did learn something. Uh, friends, as you're ready, well, let's stand and sing as we sing Hymn of Promise.
and you may be seated. This morning, reading from the prophet Haggai in the second chapter. In the second year of King Darius, in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you that saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Is it not in your sight as nothing? Yet now take courage. O Zerubbabel, says the Lord, take courage, O Joshua, son of Je Jehoshadak, the high priest. Take courage, all you people of the land, says the Lord. Work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the promise that I made you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit abides among you, do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once again, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations, so that the treasure of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with splendor, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The latter splendor of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So you may remain seated as we sing. We're going to sing together now. Swing low, sweet cherry.
So today is All Saints Day. We'll be recognizing all the saints that have gone on to be with God. And that, that's just in the last year, but also those that, uh, that we uh, think about from our past, people we know. Uh, when we do Holy Communion in the United Methodist Church, everyone is invited to come. The only thing we ask you to do is answer this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table. I can't read that. All that love him. I really can't read that. All that love him. I'm going to read it this way. <laughs> Christ our Lord invites to his table all that love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live at peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Together, friends, merciful God, we, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have, we have failed, failed to be an obedient church. We, we have not done your will. We have, we have broken, broken your law. We have, we have rebelled against your love. Your love. We, we have not loved, loved our neighbors, neighbors and we, we have, have not heard the cry of need. Forgive, Forgive us, we pray. Forgive us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I mean, I want to spend just a minute. Let's fix this. Johnny, take number seven and uh, turn it down a little bit. Just number seven should get it. It seems to be just okay. That's better. It was it was messing me up. I was hearing myself in a different way. I get to stand here for AJ since she's short. Yeah, he's so tall. <laughs> uh, at this time, I want to invite the ushers to come forward for the collection of our gifts, ties, and offerings. Let us pray. Gracious God, every day we get up to a new day, to a new start, to new life. Today you have given us the opportunity to be in worship, to honor one of our vows of being present. And so now we ask you to accept our gifts and our tithes and our offerings Take them and use them to glorify your name in this community and throughout the entire world in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading this morning comes the gospel of Luke. It's in the 20th chapter. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless. Then the second and the third married her, and in the same way all seven died childless. Finally the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For all seven had married her. Jesus said to them, those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are they given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God. 
being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God, not of the dead, but of the living. For to him, all of them are alive. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. There's a hymn every year we sing at the beginning of annual conference. We sing it here every now and then. It's to the tune of Blessed Be the Tithe of Minds. All of y'all are familiar with that. Let me find it here. And these are the words that fit along with what Jesus is saying to us today. It says, And are we yet alive? And see each other's face. Glory and thanks to Jesus give for His almighty grace. Preserved by power divine to fill full salvation here. Again in Jesus' praise we join and in His sight appear. What troubles have we seen? What mighty conflicts past? Fightings without and fears within since we assembled last. Yet out of all the Lord hath brought us by his love, and still he doth his help afford and hides our life above. Then let us make our boast of his redeeming power, which saves us to the uttermost till we can sin no more. So I entitled this message today, Are We Yet Alive? And this is always, for me, a really interesting passage to read because to me, this is one of the most uplifting passages in all the Bible. It reminds us that from the moment we accept Jesus Christ and become His children, we never die. That's good news, isn't it? I mean, really, isn't that good news? Yep. Now, our body's going to die. And, and what we're hearing here from this gospel is that Jesus and God is not the God of the dead body, which is no longer useful or has any purpose, but the God of the living. In other words, that living breath in us continues in the spirit forever. More good news, right? And yet, it seems that because of our worldly ambition, our worldly desires, when we lose somebody really close to us, we're sad. But if we believe what we believe, they've simply made a transition from this to that. They're not dead. They're still alive. That's what this scripture reminds us. They are alive with Jesus Christ. And if we believe that, then there's a little bit of room for grief and sadness about what we ourselves have lost. But there's great joy in the fact that we'll see him again. Amen. I spent, I don't know how many years, thinking that this whole death and dying thing, I remember 1957 when my grandmother died, my grandfather died. I, in the middle of the evening, I had already gone to bed. Dad was washing dishes. I remember this clear as a bell. And, and I was laying there in my bed thinking about dying. I was six. I didn't understand death at all. Not sure I totally understand it even now. And I remember getting up and walking around the corner into where my dad was washing dishes, dishes and I said, I'm scared. Will I die? And he said, you will die, but probably not today. And then he spent some time just being my dad. I don't think he really answered my questions or solved my problems about it. But he let me know that I was okay, he was okay, and that we're going to be okay, and that my grandfather had been healed of all his sicknesses and was in heaven. When my oldest son was uh, two, his grandmother died. And I came, was living in Beaumont, I came, was bringing him to Houston where we had to do all the funeral preparation. And we're riding along in the car and he looks at me and he says, Dad, 
How did Grandma get to heaven? This is a two-year-old. I said, well, I don't know. He said, well, is there an elevator? <laughs> is it an escalator? I said, I think she just kind of floats. <laughs> Great question, though, huh? Yeah. Great question. The sadness was that as my mother-in-law, the funeral preparations were made, and I was not a preacher at that time, but I was active in church. The family said, well, who's going to do the service? They didn't have one. They didn't have a preacher. They didn't have anybody. I called a friend of mine. He was had been a pastor for me at one time. In fact, I think he still was a pastor in Beaumont. He drove over and met with the family, heard a few things about Bobby so he could do a service. My sister-in-law, so we, we did the whole deal. Bobby was buried. My sister-in-law moved in with my wife's stepfather because they didn't have a faith family. Her grief was huge. And finally, Lloyd, who was my father-in-law, stepfather-in-law, he finally had to tell her to leave. <laughs> he had kind of moved on. He was doing okay, but my sister-in-law wouldn't leave. She just stayed there because she wanted to be in the place where her mother had been. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that's sad for me when somebody doesn't have a concept that Jesus and God have the power to bring us into full healing in the kingdom. But I also get sad when people think you have to die to get there. I see glimpses of heaven around us even live and in color in front of me. Some of y'all got to see one, I think, when, and I'm not sure this guy wasn't an angel when this guy named Matthew showed up in the pumpkin patch. Haven't seen him since. Homeless. Didn't ask us for money. Hung out with us. Helped us load pumpkins in trucks. Worked harder than most of us. Had this interesting spirit about him of doing that work. He was homeless, but he wasn't filthy. He was dirty, but not filthy. I invited him to church. I'm sort of disappointed that he hadn't come. So, friends, let me tell you. The, the church that we all think about in our mind, that mental picture we have of church, that relates a lot more closely to the first part of this passage. Where, where people want a logical explanation. You know, they're, they're trying to make Jesus look bad. Moses said that if a brother dies and he die, dies childless, that his brother has to marry the wife, and so forth and so on. And, we, and we're there testing Jesus, saying, whose wife is she in heaven? We spend an inordinate amount of time saying, if you don't think like I think, if you don't answer, check all the boxes, then you may or may not be welcome here. And I want to tell you, the, the church has been that way for a long time. Probably in 1957, 58. I was sitting in the back of the room at a Methodist church. We weren't yet United Methodists at that time. I was sitting in the back of the room when somebody in the, in the administrative board said, what will we do if a person from a different race shows up in this church? And people actually said, we will close the Bible and shut the doors. In a Christian church? In a Methodist church? Yeah, it was 57, 58, 59. It's a different time, wasn't it? So the church that we always think about when church was growing and, and attendance was booming and it was full and ever, I always had that memory. There are people that remember standing room only in this, this sanctuary. When, when we had that, we were living in a different time. We were a homogenous society that looked the same, worked in the same kind of places, had the same kind of background, and we were happy to be around each other. Friends, that country is gone. We live in a different one now. People 
People that work in refineries live next door to people that work for NASA. People that work in offices work next door to people that do construction. The world's changed. This church, when it was built in 1957, it was built with the idea that you'd have little bitty rooms, you have little bitty groups of Sunday school people. Churches being built now don't even have Sunday school rooms. They have big rooms where people can do big things together. I don't know what the answer is, but I know that I believe we are yet alive. Amen. And I believe the Spirit is moving, and I think with all the controversy that's going on in the world, and some that we've had within the United Methodist Church, we're just about to get past that, and we're going to be ready to move on into doing the work that the kingdom calls us to do. I wish I could tell you what that's going to be. Other churches are, are having discernment about whether to stay United Methodist or not. I'm having discernment about how do we do what God has called us to do. Well, we get some chances. We're going to do Angel Tree. We're going to buy gifts for people who have parents that are incarcerated. Every time we, well, we used to deliver them to people's houses. And when we did that, I've always heard from somebody, well, we're taking these gifts. That's a really nice house. Why are we buying gifts for them? These kids' parents are in prison. It has nothing to do with where they're living today. They deserve to know that God's amazing grace is going to provide a gift from a parent that can in their parent's name, and we're going to do it because God called us to do it. That's why. Amen. Do we get a reward for it? Not really, but we get to see the kingdom of heaven at work, don't we? During Lent, we collect stuff. I don't know what we're going to collect this year for kids that are CPS kids because the reality is CPS kids, when they move from one place to the other, don't have much stuff, and what they have usually goes in a trash bag. Now, I don't know about you, but if we're going to pray that prayer, that, that Lord's Prayer that says, I pray for God's kingdom to come on earth the way it is in heaven, I don't believe God wants children to have to move with a trash bag. And I know that there are some people that just think we ought to all be the same. But I'm so glad y'all don't all think like I do. I'm so glad you don't have the same solutions to the problems I do. I'm glad we get together into a community where people have diverse thought and different ideas and we come up with stuff. So i got to tell you, all these ideas about what we're going to do in the future to serve God, they can't come from me. We need to collaborate. We get together. We figure it out. What is God's calling us to do? And where I would start is what's happening in our community right now that's breaking Jesus' heart. People having to use that food box. Don't you think that probably breaks his heart? People that are homeless. People that are not even associating or talking to their kinfolk because they vote for some other guy. People that want to spend more time pointing fingers than they do looking at their own stuff. I don't know. You think that breaks Jesus' heart? Yeah. And if it does, then we've got to look at what, what part we play in that. And so the church, we know the church should be open and accepting and welcoming of everybody, but the church is filled with people. And the people have to have their heart open. Now, I'm not suggesting that we all pal around and go to, you know, games and bowling and stuff with people that we really don't like their lifestyle or what they believe in. But I am suggesting when we walk into this building, when we walk into any church, that we, we use that cleansing of the foyer out there to get rid of our stuff and we come in here knowing that the main stuff is the main stuff. And you say, well, preacher, what's the main stuff? Well, some people would say it's a virgin birth. That's important. I believe in that, don't you? But I don't think that's the main thing. Some people would say it's the crucifixion. Yeah, that's important. I mean, we got an empty cross over here. We got the crucifixion on the stained glass in the front. That's important. I don't think that's they they crucified lots of people. But when Mary Magdalene and the women 
went to the tomb, guess what they found? The tomb was empty. That's the main thing. And you know what? If my friends that go down to the Pentecostal church where they want to speak in tongues, raise their hands in the air and hoop and holler, if they believe that, I'm good to do work with them. How about you? Amen. <laughs> and my friends down at the Catholic church who have all that pomp and ceremony about what they do in church, you know, as long as they believe that tomb's empty, I'm good to do business with them too. Let's go work together in the kingdom. Amen. We need to quit our infighting about whether Methodists are better than Baptists or the Lutherans or whatever. That's that's eleventh. That's 1,500 years ago stuff. Some people are going to find their way to Jesus in a particular fashion with a particular kind of music or maybe a particular set of things. I'm absolutely convinced that in spite of all his failings and the stuff Jimmy Swagger did, the people who came to faith in his church were really Christian. How about you? Yep. <clears throat> The bakers, not these bakers, the other bakers. People came to faith, even though there was some fraudulent stuff going on. But you know what? Jesus is still Jesus, and He can come to you through no matter who, any way He wants to, any time He wants to. And I want to tell you, He can even come to help other people through you. Jesus says right here in Luke, God is not the God of the dead. He's God of the living. If we believe that, that when we lose a loved one, then we, yes, we grieve and we're sad because they're not with us anymore, but we ought to be overjoyed that they've already made the trip that we're going to get to make soon someday. If this is just a finite thing where we live and walk on this earth and then we're gone, what's the point? I, I, we did a study a few years ago on different religions and I'll never forget the way Adam Hamilton talked about Buddhists, and, and, and I, I don't have anything against Buddhists. Buddhists really don't have a concept of God at all. In fact, a Buddhist could become a Christian and remain Buddhist because they don't really have a concept of God. They have a concept of, of nirvana. They, they have these great things they say like, you can't step into the same river twice, which is true. But can you imagine having a friend or a relative that was a Buddhist that lost a little child from any disease and being the preacher or the church member that stood up and said, you know, the light of little Johnny was great and he's gone. That's not our faith, right? Our faith is that that light springs eternal. And just because this body wears out. We're not gone. Now I think that's good news. How about you? Amen. I think that's some of the best news. You know, maybe some of you, you know, let me tell you, when you pass that 70 year mark on your life, you realize one day I'm a lot closer to the end than I am to begin. Actually, it probably happens at about 60, but I was just trying to be nice. <laughs> you know, we're closer to the end than we are at the beginning. If you haven't had these thoughts about eternity and accepting Jesus and believing in eternity and believing these words that God is the God of the living, it's time to have them, friends, because we don't have that much time left. And I don't think we have to worry about it in this room, but I want to tell you there's people out there that don't know it. And I think that breaks Jesus' heart too. So as we look at what we're going to do and how we're going to do it and what we do over the next months and years, how are we going to do ministry? What's it going to look like? There is not a church in this town or this conference that has that really figured out. Because let me tell you the truth. Before COVID, we're all using COVID for an excuse, but before COVID, it was already in decline. I've been a preacher 20 years. It's been in decline the whole time. Why? Because other things are important. Next week in the sermon here, you're going to hear about where your treasure is, your heart will follow. And it's not just talking about your money. 
talking about your heart. Where is your heart going? Let me tell you, we could go drive around right now. I could take you some places. We could see clearly where somebody's treasure is, couldn't we? Big boats, big houses, big lots of frivolous things. And this is the challenge when you live in this country, in this particular community. If we don't realize that our heart's going to go where our focal point is, then we need to start learning that right now. Took me a long time to figure it out. I don't expect people to come to an instant decision. But it's worth thinking about. Instead of waking up every day and saying, well, I gotta go down and pay my dues at the church. <laughs> what we need to be thinking about is, am I doing everything I can for the kingdom? Not everything I wanna do, not everything that's convenient. Am I doing everything I can for the kingdom? I don't know about you, but that one takes me to school sometimes. Because the answer is no. Some of the time. But I want it to be better. I want us to do better. But it's going to take a whole bunch of us individually starting to work together to make a difference. I've seen God at work. I've seen lives changed. I've seen marriages saved. I've seen people get together in marriage because of the church. I've seen lives restored. I've seen people that died. And there was great joy as we sent them off to the next phase of whatever life is like. Today, I'm going to mention some of those people as we do communion. I chose not to sing those other songs today, like For All the Saints, the one that's so hard for us to sing. And I, I thought, you know, let's sing Sweet Law, Sweet Low, Sweet Cherry. Coming for to carry me home. You know the real origin of that, right? Is that's what the slaves sang to each other when they were out in the cotton fields. They were talking about the, the Underground Railroad was coming. If you get there before I do, tell them I'm coming. So friends, if you get there before I do, tell them I'm coming. I'm coming and I want to get there and I want to be a part of that and I want to find out what it's like and I'm not afraid. But I also know my time isn't quite yet. And I got some work to do in this group, this planet, these people. Yep. And I think you do too. Yep. So we'll be ready when the time comes. It won't be sad. We'll be joyful about the transition, but we all know that God is calling us not for the dead, but for the living. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. As you're able, would you please stand? Take this opportunity to offer signs of peace and reconciliation to each other in the church. And uh, we'll resume with communion shortly.
It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God. You are the creator of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Miriam and Moses, God of Joshua and Deborah, God of Ruth and David, God of the priests and the prophets, God of Mary and Joseph. God of the apostles and the martyrs. God of our mothers and our fathers. God of our children and to all generations. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you and then he broke the bread. Giving it to his disciples, he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and gave it to the disciples. He said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ is dying. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by its blood. 
Renew our communion with all your saints, especially those whom we name before you now. Buddy Garvin. Joe Phelps. Jeannie Peterson. Patrick Williams. Mel Tinkleberg. Brandy Jones. Horace Burnett. Greg Jenkins. God says we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Strengthen us to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ. Make us one with each other. And one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at His heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And the church says, Amen. Amen. Once again, the United Methodist Church, all are invited to come. Uh, we're serving currently uh, by intention, except that I'm going to hand you the bread. I'll, I'll dip it to and then hand it to you. So if you'll just come with your hands open, you'll receive that way. Uh, there is a bucket up here for our mission offering. This, uh, this is a special Sunday in the United Methodist Church where we collect money for United Methodist students. Uh, I was a beneficiary of that when I went to seminary, and it was, it's useful for students of all different kinds. So if you have some spare change, uh, we're not asking much. Just if you have nickels, dimes, and quarters, spare change, you put it in the bucket, we'll send that on to, the, to be dispersed that way. Friends, the table is prepared. Come to this place where heaven and earth meet. And if you receive, you're always welcome to pray here at the altar rails if you want. We will be singing, or there will be music during communion. These are songs you know, so come along, sing along. And help AJ so she doesn't feel like she's doing so.
we've been to the place. We've been to the place. Whoops, I have no sound. Hello, there we go. We have, uh, we've been to the place we're having an earth meet. We've, we've experienced God's love and grace beyond any comparison. And the question is, are we yet alive? And we are. To be ministers of the gospel. Until we get to the place where Jesus ministers to us full time. Uh, we're going to sing now as we end our service today. We invite you to come forward if this would be the day you would unite with our church. We're going to sing Set Forth by God's Blessing. It's, uh, the words are on the screen. And stand as you're able. Set forth by God's blessing our true faith and resting the leadership of Jesus Christ, but friends, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that will get us through. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.